Hello and welcome to the Diverse Bookshelf with me, Samia Aziz. On this show, I interview incredible authors doing a deep dive into important themes and issues while talking all things books. On this week's episode, I'm speaking to Saima Mir, journalist and crime novelist, author of The Khan and its sequel, Vengeance. In her books, Saima introduces us to Jia Khan, a successful lawyer, her London life is a long way from the grubby northern streets she knew as a child, where her father headed up the Pakistani community and ran the local organised crime syndicate. Often his jirga rule, the old way, was violent and bloody, but it was always justice of a kind. In her books, Saima explores morality, humanity, family, kinship, community, patriarchy, and the unfair expectations placed on women. She explores what people are forced to do to survive and the grey lines between right and wrong. Saima Mir is an award-winning journalist and writer. She has written for The Guardian, The Times, The Independent and The Daily Telegraph and worked for the BBC. Her work appeared in the anthology It's Not About the Burqa in 2019 and The Best Most Awful Job in 2020. Her first novel, The Khan, was published in January 2021 and has been optioned by BBC Studios. Vengeance is sequel is out in June 2024. Saima is a recipient of the Commonwealth Broadcast Association Worldview Award and the K.E. Blundell Trust Award. Saima's work has been long listed for the SI Leeds Literary Prize and the Bath Novel Award. Her screenplay, Ruby and Matt, has been optioned by Rendition Films. I'm so glad that Saima's my guest today. Hello, Saima. Welcome to the Diverse Bookshelf podcast. It's so wonderful to have you on the show. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So you are the author of The Khan, (laughs) the infamous Khan, which is a novel based on this organised crime syndicate in the north of England and we meet our wonderful character of Jia Han. And the sequel, Vengeance, is coming out in the world um, in early June, which is hopefully what we'll be talking about today. And it is just absolutely amazing. I want to know where it all started for you. Why did you decide to write a book about crime and this sort of underworld and this organized crime syndicate that is taking place in your in your novels um I really love to read because I find it entertaining I'm not one of these fantastic readers who reads and intellectualizes everything I just Mm. read because it's fun it's the same as watching Netflix for me and I have done since I was a really small child and so I wanted to read a story which had the kind of women in who I knew and by that I don't mean criminals I mean like really smart savvy clever, beautiful Muslim women and who were of Pakistani heritage. And I just couldn't see that anywhere. And I loved crime stories. So I like Godfather a lot. And when I watched The Godfather, it reminded me so much of family, like a really big, old, desi family. And so much of that film for me wasn't about them as being criminals. It was about the intersections between family and how fathers and sons and this kind of stuff. And so I wanted to write a story with this like really kick-ass Muslim woman, which was the opposite of what I was seeing in media that was portrayed. But every Muslim woman I knew was just really fantastically strong. And I thought, what if I took a crime novel and just turned it on his head and did something that surprised the majority of readers in this country? And that's where the Khan came from. Yeah, I find that so interesting because... I, I feel like when when we become so frustrated with the representation that we see of Muslim women, which is often like oppressed and quiet and unable to live the life that she wants to live and not intelligent and not funny and not interesting. I guess the instinct is then to create this like absolutely amazing woman who is doing everything that you would that society wants her to do and she is quote unquote good so she's successful in her career but she's kind she's law abiding she's a law abiding citizen she's not breaking any laws she's uh really good to her family she doesn't have any sort of like you know a gray there's no the no grayness to her character but you've taken that and sort of like put it on its head almost and shown us that 
being good or being empowered doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to be morally upstanding at all times and sometimes your circumstances your situation your family whatever it may be puts you in situations where you need to do things that are I guess morally gray or wrong in in some ways there are some things that are probably uh you know like you you shouldn't question whether or not they're right or wrong and I really like that I really like that sort of looking at that differently so uh, one of the things I experienced when I was very young I was divorced really early and I always thought I'd lived this really exactly the kind of woman you've described I thought I was her and yet when I did this one thing of speaking the truth and saying I don't want to live in this situation suddenly I was maligned Mm. and I was there was a lot of judgment placed upon me so who I thought I was and who I was portrayed to be by other people really shocked me and I loved the idea of putting that on this woman so no matter what we do we can't can um, change the way people see us can we they bring their own lens to us and so I thought this woman is just going to do exactly what she pleases and not care about the fact that people are judging her. And somehow, though, she thinks she's right. Mm. Somehow she thinks everything she is doing is morally upright and the absolute right thing to do. And she's um, making a difference to people's lives. And I love that. I love the nuance and the grey of people because I don't know anybody who lives in the black and white. We all have shades of grey within us. And some people have more shades of grey than others. And so I just wanted to extrapolate that and make her this this woman who was the opposite of she's had enough, basically. She's had enough of trying to toe the line and do what everybody else says. And so um, as far as she's concerned, it's just between her and her maker. And that's it. And, and, you know, she does some bad things. Yeah. And this, I mean, in Vengeance, I feel like we see that almost like duality, like more clearly. And so there's a lot of times when obviously like, they know that like what they're doing, you know, there's there's been harm done or there's, you know, someone's lost their life or been killed or whatever, something bad happened. But at the same time, we see Gia really struggling with how can we help people? How can we get people out of living in this in this absolute squalor? Um, we can't shut down our operations because so many people rely on us for a source of income. We're doing so much for the city. Really interesting sort of duality of like good and bad and right and wrong existing at the same time and how one I guess can somehow justify or uphold the other and there's a really interesting line that comes up in Vengeance where one of the characters says the greyest lines are the easiest to cross and I absolutely love it I absolutely love it because it's so true like when we think in black and white and we think in binaries we kind of know like this is a line and we shouldn't cross it because it's it's a black line or it's a red line. But when it's grey, there's no rules about what to do about it and you don't know how to how to read that. And yeah, I just wonder if you could unpack that a little bit, that idea of when there is a grey line uh, or when something is so grey, who is to decide what should happen? I don't know. That's the thing, isn't it? I don't. One of the things about great things about writing fiction is you don't have to have all the answers and you mm. can make your characters question things. Islam is quite black and white in a lot of things, isn't it? Not in everything. I think there's a lot of there's a lot of ease in there. In fact, it is a religion of ease. That's what we're taught. Mm. And we as people have made this is black and this is white. And I understand to a point why we do that when we're children, because, you know, you don't, for example, things like you don't tell a lie. As a child, you're taught you don't tell a lie. And then as an adult, people become, oh, we have degrees of lying. This is a white lie and this is a... Mm. And if you go down that path of, well, this is a white lie, then it does become easier to eventually do that other thing. And it's a slippery slope of of life, isn't it? And I know that from when I was 19, 20, and the way I lived and the way I live now. And I'm not sure if, I'm not sure which is right, but somehow my mind decides to justify all my actions and all my behaviours and tell me that I'm okay, I'm doing the right thing. But I know that 21-year-old me would be like, Simon, you've completely lost the plot here. Like, you're doing some things that are not acceptable. But somehow life has worn away the edges of things and very much like Jia Khan and not in a criminal kingpin kind of way at all. But you make decisions for survival and suddenly you have responsibilities for other people, for children, for 
husbands, for in-laws, for siblings. And none of those decisions that you made for yourself, you would make for yourself, you can make for them. And so it's an exploration of that. And also, I do think, so one of the things I really thought when I was young was that Islam is just black and white and we just come into it clean and we leave clean. And then as I got older and the more I read and the more I lived, I saw, actually, this is the dunya, this is the world, this is not the afterlife, and this is the test, and we are going to get skirmished, and we are going to get mud on us as we walk through the world. And it's that constant balancing of the equation of good and bad and the different angels on the shoulders. I think that's fascinating. And I don't have any answers, but what I do have is a lot of questions, and I try and put those into my stories. Yeah, I just, I find it... It's like so fascinating the way that that you explored it because I I guess we all have that in our own lives about things that we perceive to be a grey area, just sort of understanding or having the courage sometimes as well to decide what to do, but also sometimes the things that you are forced to do for your own survival and, and for those around you. And I guess one of the quotes from the the Khan that was widely shared and loved by everyone is this idea that, you know, you said, be twice as good as men and four yeah. times as good as white men. And I wondered if you could talk about that quote a little bit, tell tell us where that came from and, and what of your own experiences really feed into that. So my whole life, I think, feeds into that. Mm. So one of the things I found was that I was quite naive and innocent in life and I thought well I'm doing the right thing and everybody else is doing the right thing too and we're just going through life and then I realized that when people view me they view me through the lens of my skin color they view me through the lens of my chosen faith they view me through my Arabic name they view me through the fact that my parents came here from Pakistan and when they look at me through those lenses everything about me diminishes in their view and so when I walk into a room if I make a mistake, I'm held to a much higher standard. And unfortunately, that was my experience of life. And so what I did was I realized that I had to work much harder Mm -hmm. than my equivalent counterparts. And it was the system. The system was set up that way. And I think most people around that time didn't even understand the biases that they had. I'd like to say it's different now. And at least we're more aware of things. We talk about privilege and we talk about bias and we talk about you know, our prejudices. And so for me, and it's a thing I've had to learn, remind myself of when I feel I've not hit a mark, is that for me to be in a room, to be in a job at the BBC, or for me to be in a publishing meeting, it was harder because I had to crack open those doors. I had mm. to, there were doors somewhere that weren't open. There were doors that had been opened by other women, other Muslim women, other brown faces. Um, and that was fantastic. But for some of us, there was there was nothing. There was no path. We had to get our spades and dig and cut stuff down. And we did have to be better. And we, and it's unfortunate. I think we still do have to be better. And I think until we dismantle those structures that see us through those lenses, we will have to be be better. Yeah. It's really heartbreaking to me. Yeah, I think the reason why it was like so widely shared and loved was because it it resonates, I think, with so many people. It is such a a real lived experience. You know, there's no, there's no actual law or like quota or I don't know, rule that stops women like you and me from getting into certain places, getting into certain universities or certain jobs. But it's it's the idea that like access is so narrow and like you said like we have to work so much harder to get to the same position and I think that is not understood enough it seems to be you know a celebration when there's women women of color at the top of any industry or at the best universities but not a real understanding of what it's taken for them to get there you lose parts of yourself along the way you do lose parts of yourself And you do, and I think you compromise things that you never thought you would compromise. And it's, like I said, it's the grey. You're slipping into the grey and you're trying to understand it and justify it. And if you've got bills to pay and you've got children to feed, you're slowly doing that. One thing I really wanted to write about in in both Khan and The Vengeance was there's so much judgment placed on women for the decisions we make. And actually, what we need is more help. 
what we need is support and understanding. We don't need judgment. So I don't think any woman goes into, I mean, one of the things, the Khan opens with the scene of a woman who's a, um, she's a prostitute. And I really wanted to show that that woman, she's not some woman who's just woken up and decided, I'm going to do this for a living. Things happen to people and it's a slow erosion of their life. And who would make that choice if other choices were available to them? But the, the, like you said, the doorways are so narrow for us to fit through. You know, when you apply to university, when I applied to university, got over 30 years ago, and you filled out this UCAS form and you, you know, were you doing these extracurricular activities? I wasn't doing any extracurricular activities. I was going to school and I was going home. I was offering my namaz and I was sitting down, I was watching TV and I was doing my homework and I was really good. I was doing my homework, you know, Mm. my parents didn't come from a background where we went horse riding or we played tennis. And even if I did decide to play tennis, the way that my attire was not that of, someone who would be playing tennis on the tennis court and convincing my parents that this is what I need to do or even justifying it to myself you know I would never put on a small skirt and go play tennis and that's not shade or judgment on any woman who would it was just the way I was raised Mm. so for me if I even if I made that decision that movement from you know point a to point where I do go on that tennis court was vast it was a thing that I wasn't able to cross along with everything else but that box that I was supposed to fit in that was supposed to get me into those certain universities wanted me to do extracurricular activities Mm. Um, with a lack of understanding of that not everybody comes from that world Mm. and I do speak multiple languages and I can quote all kinds of poetry and I can do all kinds of extracurricular things that just don't fit that white western mold of what that is yeah and it's hard it it wears you down doesn't it It makes you tired yeah it makes you tired and that's the thing that I think like now that I'm I mean I'm I'm in my 30s and I'm already feeling like gosh I'm I feel so tired and and it's not that like you know I'm getting good sleep or whatever is it is that I know I have been working so hard from when I was like I started school because I always felt like I need to do well and I need to work harder to stand out and to even if my grades and I think especially when you're applying for university you hear this that like oh there's going to be thousands of people applying with the exact same grades as you even if you're at the top the exact same grades as you you have to stand out but when you come from like a culture but also like financial constraints where you can't afford private tennis lessons or swimming lessons or to go skiing or whatever it is that people do you you're you're just out there like okay but how how do I stand out in a way that you're gonna understand that I'm amazing yeah. as I am well, exactly mm. and also one of the things I feel I was never told was I wore hijab when I was from like 16 onwards to when I was I think I was about 23 and it was a thing I loved and it was a thing I thought was really beautiful and it was a thing I really wanted to do I don't think I had the understanding of how people would perceive me when I was walking into a room with that one mm. and it's not a thing that we ever talk about because sometimes I think we feel it's disrespectful to those women who are wearing it but I think we need to talk about it because it adds to the respect of what those women are doing and what those women are wearing because there are people the minute you walk into a room with your head covered who make the assumption that you're oppressed or that you have been forced to do this or somehow your brain is less than the woman whose hair is uncovered and that then pits us against each other, even as Muslim women. And again, it's that division of who we are and what we are. And this is a good Muslim woman and this is a bad Muslim woman. And I wanted to talk about all of that in the Khan and in Vengeance. And in all our lives, it just colours everything. And that goes into that, be four times as good as a white man. Because a white guy just has a shower and goes. As a woman, we have to do our makeup, we have to do our hair, we have to wear nice clothes. You know, we have to be forthright, but not too forthright. You know, we have to be uncovered, but not too uncovered. We have to be able to do all these things and navigate them and do the job that he does, but at a better level and then not be married and not have a baby because then that would be, you know, take us away from our work. And we carry that stuff and it's exhausting. It's just so exhausting. 
Absolutely. And you do actually in, in Vengeance, there's this, there's this bit, which I, which I really like, I laughed out loud because Gia said like, oh, that woman she expect, or that person expected me to speak with an Urdu accent. But, you know, when she hears the way that I speak and hears the, the name of the university that I went to, suddenly everything changes and they realize who yes. they're dealing with. And I, I find that a lot because all the time I'm, I'll be wearing a gorda when I go out because it's comfortable and it's loose and I like it. Um, yes. And I know, and I wear hijab and I know that sometimes from the way that people speak to me and the way that they look at me until I've spoken, they think I can't speak English. Yes. And it frust- and it and it frustrates me. It's there's nothing wrong with it if I couldn't speak English, but the yeah. fact is that they've made the assumption based on how they think I look. Um, which yeah, it's just yeah, yeah. And that assumption is tiring, and it's easy to say, oh, it's assumption, brush it off. But over and over again, it exactly. is exhausting. Someone said to me something about you know when we talk about integrating, it has the word great in it. Mm. It grates. It grates yeah. at me. That I have to, you know, that people look at you. And do they do this thing with you? They do this thing with me sometimes where I'm speaking English and I'm getting very clipped in my accent and I'm speaking very correctly and very properly. And then they're like, their eyes are sort of, it's almost like they're going in and out of focus because their brain cannot compute how <laughs> my face is speaking English at this level. It's like, but I don't understand, but I don't understand. And then, so, <laughs> and it's so tiring. It's like, leave us alone. We don't just speak English. We speak a few other languages as well, some of us. So you only speak English. We speak this very well. We write in it. We exactly. work in it. And we speak a few others too. Exactly. So I'm really intrigued to know how you sort of developed your understanding of this world where this organised crime syndicate is taking place in the north of Bradford in your book uh, in the north of England in your books um you don't know to specify that it's Bradford I just made I just made the assumption <laughs> but a lot of people make that assumption and it's because I grew up in Bradford yeah. and I love that city and I worked there so I mm-hmm. was a trainee reporter at the Telegraph and Argus which is a newspaper in Bradford and I started out there I was a cub reporter and I covered a lot of things and one of the things I covered was crime Hmm. And when I covered crime, I was the only um, non-white reporter in that newsroom when I started out. And so you can imagine, Bradford has a large uh, South Asian contingent. It has a large Pakistani community. I speak the language. I grew up there. I went to school there. I went to university there. Hmm. And so I had access to things that other people didn't have. Hmm. And people trusted me in ways that they didn't trust other reporters. Hmm. Partly also because I could, you know, navigate the cultural differences and I could speak the languages and I could speak to somebody in Urdu or in Punjabi or, you know, I could understand enough Mipuri um, to get by. And I would hear these amazing stories about stuff that was going on. One of the things I used to do was there was a place in Bradford called Café Lahore, um, which I think is now called the British Asian Kitchen. And I used to hang out there. It had just opened and the guy who'd set it up he used to have curry and then after that school dinner puddings. And it was a place when um, desserts, high, desserts had just become the thing. Okay. And it just started out it's before it was like it is now. And it was where you went if you didn't drink. So if you didn't drink, where would you go on an evening? So I, when I was on a late shift, used to go there. We used to hang out there. Mm. And I'd take my mobile phones from work. I was on a shift. I would finish at about 11. Everybody would leave the office about 5. And I would take my phones and I'd hang out. You, you've got to call the police every hour and the fire and you've got to find out what's going on. And you're supposed to find stories. And so I would just hear some amazing stuff when I was there. You know, people would come in and tell me stuff and I'd hear these urban myths. And you meet a lot of interesting people. When you're in court, you see drug dealers and you see people who are up for crimes. And that's where a lot of this came from. Covering the stories, hearing things that other people didn't hear. Having someone come up to me and go, listen, I'm going to tell you this story. This is what's really going down in this city. That's where a lot of that research came from. It's absolutely fascinating because it's actually like so complex, like in both the Han and Vengeance, like there's so many different things going on. Some of them are interlinked, but some of them not. Like it's just this very intense and 
vast web of things going on that seemingly has one person at the head of it, Akbar Khan in the Han and then Jia Han later on in Vengeance. And it just, yeah, like it's it's phenomenal actually if you, to think that something is like a group of people that are managing to control and influence and impact so much. And obviously like there's there's issues with that. There's people being taken advantage of. There's money laundering and crime and all kinds of stuff going on. But it is also just absolutely fascinating. And I love what you said earlier about the like the the family aspect of it and how actually like our families operate in a very similar way and that like they're all, all very interconnected, very vast, um, lots of power struggles, lots of strange and interesting dynamics but how the the idea of having family at the heart of something like this rather than business rather than just like business partners I think also changes things and you have you have spoken also about what the extent that you would go for people that you love what do you think really having this being like a family business rather than just like one person doing it in secret what that does to the thing itself I think it makes it a lot more interesting. It's so much more complex, isn't it? Because it adds so much more emotion to it. You know, people always say it's business. It's not personal. Well, this is all personal. Mm. And also our families share our secrets and they know, they know where our metaphorical, you know, bod- bodies are buried as well as in this case, the, the actual physical body. Physical. <laughs> yeah. And it's really hard to separate um, oneself from the people that we have once loved. And I love writing about that. There's a real grief, isn't there, about mm. we lose people that we loved. And as you change and you grow, you do lose people. Also, there's this thing I heard a lot growing up about we shouldn't cut the ties of the womb, the ties of kinship, the ties of the womb. And it's a really big Islamic thing that people are told. And I feel like we're bound in it, you know, from childhood. All these relationships, oh, paradise lies at the feet of our mother respect we go our mother's sisters and I I just thought it was a really interesting thing to play with I just think family everybody has some kind of family whether it's actually blood family or um, the family that they've chosen so it just makes everything more complicated and more interesting mm-hmm. and more texturized and it's really great because you can't really lose them even mm-hmm. if you don't see them again if you catch up with them 10 years from now you're still back where you started because you had history you shared mm-hmm some kind of relative or some kind of maybe you shared a womb mm. um you know you had christmas dinner together you had eve dinner together you might have had lunches together uh you hated the same people when you were kids but you also the other thing which i think is really interesting about family is you may have had the same upbringing and the same known the same people and experienced them completely differently yeah which I also think is really yeah Absolutely. And so when you, so, you know, you've written the character of Gia. I mean, I I think she's a very fascinating character, but she hasn't landed that well with some of your readers, maybe a lot of your readers. I think they have found Gia to be unlikable, just, and I, and I can understand it because she's a very standoffish character, but that I feel like is kind of how she has to be. But she although is the protagonist, is still quite closed. I feel like we see more of her thoughts and her feelings in Vengeance than we did in The Han, which can't, which makes sense in, in terms of the story that you're telling. But there is still something about her that is very, I don't know, very closed, very sort of... Because <clears throat> she is atypical in lots of ways, especially in in herself as as a mother, and I think that sort of filters through in different ways as how she presents herself and how she interacts with those around her. But why did you decide to have this character that was still quite close that you probably knew people wouldn't necessarily gravitate towards or wouldn't be able to love her because she wasn't she's not warm um and she doesn't almost she doesn't invite it like there's nobody really in her life that she lets in on that level there is a closeness with like Idris and Nadim but even then it's still measured so what was it like for you deciding to to make her like that 
so you know when I wrote Gia Khan, I didn't I didn't want to write her as cold. I wrote her as being really controlled, and I wrote her as a woman who was really really deeply hurt and deeply damaged by what had happened to her. And so it's interesting when you send a book out there how people respond because they don't know any of the backstory that's in your head. And so I was really surprised when people found her cold because I wrote her as a woman who, to me, deeply feels everything, but is so controlled in the what she reveals to other people that they don't realise how deeply she feels. And for me, all of her actions are steeped in the fact that she's a deeply sensitive, um, deep-feeling woman who takes on this empire because it's like, if I don't do it, this is going to happen. What she does to her son in that's revealed at the end of the Khan is because she just can't cope. Mm. So I tried to write her as that. But the thing about likeable, people not liking her is, you know, as a woman, it doesn't take much to not be liked. Mm. Um, and as I, I find that the worst thing you can do as a woman is tell the truth. You can commit any crime and you're forgiven or any whatever you consider to be a sin and it's all forgivable. But if you challenge the status quo and if you speak your truth, then people don't like it. And I've been the villain quite a lot in my life without meaning to be. And I always thought I was quite a nice, gentle um, woman. And I realised I was completely villainized for speaking the truth. And it's like, oh, Saima, she's at it again. She's telling those things. She's saying the thing. And so I was okay with writing somebody who was a villain because she's not a villain to herself. Um, she actually thinks she's one of the good guys. It's really interesting, even in the way that I asked you that question, because one of the things I said was that she's not very warm. And and I feel like this is like this is this is the product of the society that we live in, and that like we expect women to be soft and to be forthcoming, and when they're not, we immediately feel like, and I say we, and I feel just feel like everybody, we kind of feel like there's something not right, or that person is not nice, or and it's yeah. and it's again this idea that like women should be forthcoming and women should be open and polite and kind and uh, and control their rage and control their feelings um, and the minute they're not they're othered and they're isolated and they become as you said like they're, they're villainized even even if they haven't done anything villain like um yeah. they're just not being yeah we're villainized right and and i i have what my husband calls a resting bitch face <laughs> <laughs> I'm also a massive introvert and I get my social battery drains really quickly. And what I've experienced in my life is that if I'm really tired and I'm also as a writer, you're thinking about a million things and everything is a story. And somebody was joking with me the other day that I have a conversation with you and you run off with your notebook and you're writing notes, but it's true. I do. And so I'm the center of my life. And what happens is that when I zone out or I'm tired, um, there can be people can assume that I'm being a bitch or I'm being, I think, what am I thinking? I'm being rude and mm -hmm. I'm not. And it is exactly that. Whereas women, we have to be on all the time. We have to be, hi, how are you? How's everything going? And I hate that. I hate people who do that. I don't want anyone to do that to me. I'd rather someone say, you know what, I'm really tired and I really need to leave right now. And I, I'm so fine with that. And so that's kind of how I wrote her. And it was it was interesting because people did say, oh, God, I don't like her. She's so awful. And with the Khan, it really deeply cut me because I think I did see so much of myself in Jia Khan's strange behaviour. And when I wrote Vengeance, there were chapters that I was writing where I thought, oh my God, you are awful, Jia Khan. What are you doing? This is just awful. Um, and that was the moment where she and I split, I think, into two separate people. Yeah, yeah well, you know, we know that you are not a uh, criminal queen, queen pin, but <laughs> do you, I mean, I just, I, I definitely, like in Vengeance, we see so much more of her. We understand, I think, a little bit more about how she feels, what she thinks, where some of her decisions come from. But she's still, 
st- still reserved I would say even even to the mm. reader even in these like private thoughts but I guess you know at this point she's in her 40s she's ha- she's had to be this way her entire life and she was estranged from her family for so many years um I think if we really try and get into her head I'm sure we can may- maybe not like sympathize or excuse or justify some of the things that she does because there are some awful things that she does but at least understand where she's coming from she's massively yeah. traumatized isn't Absolutely. she by her yeah. by her life she lost her brother you don't do the things that she does if you're a healthy, balanced, functioning exactly. individual. Um, she's mm. massively damaged. And she's damaged by what happened to her, her experiences, but she's also damaged by society. She's also damaged by what she's seen in the law. Um, she's set out. She's was a really naive um, woman who was very protected and thought that everything was going to be okay. And she's just not handled that stuff well. And her dad's a criminal, so. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I love it. I mean, I, th- <laughs> I think the overwhelming thing I have felt for Gia in, in both of your books actually is that she, she's, she's so lonely. Like, there are so many people in her life, but she doesn't have. She doesn't have friends. She doesn't have anyone that she can really confide in. She doesn't know who she can trust. And even like with her, with her husband, she's constantly hiding things from him trying to protect him trying to protect her children not not being not understanding one another and I just I have overwhelmingly felt in in both of your books that this is just so sad like to to be a woman and be so successful in every definition and every understanding of the word but just be so lonely and I think there there must be and there are so many women experiencing that kind of loneliness and sort of like isolation and alienation from themselves and, and from other people. And that's really, um, really sad. Um, and I, and I kind of wish that we, that we had more space to, you know, just to, to talk about that and to support one another through that. Yes. You've, you've absolutely nailed it. She is, she doesn't have anybody. She's incredibly lonely. She's carrying the weight of everything. Um, yeah. And I think there's a lot of, there are, and, you know, it's about us. The thing is with her, obviously, she can't go tell anyone because they're going to put her in prison. Uh, but for the rest of us, there needs to be space for us to be vulnerable and for us to say, this is where I made a mistake or this is where I went wrong or this is what happened to me. And then that's the only way we end our loneliness. But she is. You've absolutely nailed it. That's exactly her. Yeah. One of the things that um, I also really enjoyed in Vengeance is that you give us a little bit of Akbar Khan's backstory, him arriving in the UK in the, in the 1970s from Pakistan with his brother. Um, what what were you really trying to explore and bring out about giving that backstory? Because, I mean, it didn't add, I mean, it added a little bit to, to the plot in that, like, we we found a connection to one of the characters, but, like, it, it didn't add that much to the plot you were, you were sort of moving forward. But what were you hoping to bring out by giving us his backstory? This guy was not a baddie from the start. Mm. He didn't come to this country to commit crime and to do bad things. And most people who do that, that's not what happens. When you, you come to a new country, you're an idealist, you're a dreamer. And survival happens. And also, the other thing I really want to explore and wanted to explore was the idea that people do not become villains in isolation. You know, society contributes to the things that that we become. And one, it's one of the things I saw as a reporter as well was when I'd cover stories about crimes and criminals and, and you know terrorism and things and rioting. This is not a vacuum. People don't do this you know when a baby is born that baby doesn't come with an imprint of I am going to be the criminal kingpin of the empire and so I really wanted to write about that and also a story about those men who came here in the 70s and how dapper they were and how passionate they were and how young how young they were and how Mm. they were treated when they came to a country that had called them but then didn't embrace them and I wanted to tell that story about uh, Akbar Khan and what London was like and how it would be to be a young man on your own, suddenly having arrived in this foreign land with these big dreams. 
Yeah, it was. I mean, I really in, enjoyed reading it because, it, like, it, it's true. The character that comes in in 1974 in your book was so different to who the Han ended up being. Um, and it has, it's actually like very, very sweet. Like he's, you know, he's making sure that the meat he's eating is halal because his faith means so much to him. Um, and he's talking about his brother and he's looking after his brother and his family. And it's, it is very value driven and, and very sweet. And I think, you know, we, we can understand or we do understand, I guess, once we read it, what happened and how it was never intended. And actually when, when it first comes to him as an idea to do something illegal, he says no. He's like, yeah. no, I, I, I can't do that. I don't want to do that. And I think then he's somewhat forced in some ways um, to, to to do what he did and then what it led to. And obviously, like, it's not that black and white. There were many choices and decisions along the way in the way that it grew. Yeah. But it, I thought it was a really interesting backstory. And I like generally reading about the experience of that that the generation that came in in the 70s and the 60s and the 80s because they came to such a different country as well um and they came with such hopes and as you said like so many of them were somewhat invited or called or in some ways they lost their homes and were kind of forced to come because when the mangla dam was built and everything was submerged underwater in in Meadpur. so I think, yeah, I, I mean, I really, I really enjoyed it. And I think it is nice in general as well to, to it adds different multiple layers. And then we do see Gia and some of the other characters throughout the book battle with their conscience, especially around murder and around um, the implications, I guess, of having certain people uh, removed from the system. Yeah, like, I'm just interested in how you went about exploring that and what particular things you wanted to bring out about that. I wanted to bring out the fact that not people aren't all bad or all good and they do things and they have to live with the consequences of that. And so they had got caught up in this thing that they'd done in the start of book one and actually... It was really black and white to them. They were just going to kill this guy and they were going to take it out and they were going to take over and it was all going to be fine. It's never like that, is it, in life? Mm -hmm. um, the man they killed in the first book was bad, but he was also good to some other people. Mm -hmm. so I wanted to explore that. And I also wanted to explore the fact that a lot of the themes of the Khan are about survival. Mm -hmm. And also, we just decide what's good and what's bad and what's legally acceptable and what's not we just pull things from the air from the air don't we yeah and actually it doesn't work for everybody there's a line in one of, i think it's in vengeance which is about some people don't work with a democracy they need a dictatorship <laughs> and whilst i'm not saying that's true for everybody i think everybody's different and we need to have a system that's kinder and that kind of understands mm. that I just like the idea of exploring this thing. They've killed these people. In in films, you know, you might watch Peaky Blinders, they kill somebody, but they don't ever think about it. They've just carried on, maybe. Thomas Shelby might think about it quite a bit, but um, it's just what they're doing. But you live with that. It marks your soul, doesn't it? I really wanted to explore Nadine, who's this artist, who's an actor, supposed to be a deep thinker, is how is he living with this idea that he's done this, he's taken someone's life. Um, yeah. Yeah. I did I found it really interesting because I think we again like because I guess we're so, so obsessed in thinking with binaries or so I guess like programmed to think in terms of black and white. It's very easy to just think that somebody who is caught up in a life of crime is okay with it and has accepted it and and doesn't feel it and doesn't have a conscience about it. But actually if if we know or if we really understand that in in some cases or in a lot of cases they're caught up in this way because of circumstance and, and in order to survive then it's not really it's not been a choice and when something is forced upon you like that you haven't decided that you're okay with this you just mm. it's just sort of what you end up having to do yeah, so like the smaller choices of life, which are far from murder, 
Um, so things like divorce. Well, I have experience of being divorced. Um, or if you have somebody who's hurt you and you've stepped away from them. It's never as clear cut and as easy as we'd like to believe. You might We might see people walking around and being, oh, they're absolutely fine. Look, they've done that thing and they're fine. They're, they're just carrying on. But actually the residue of that stays with you and it stays with you for a long, mm. long time. And that's something quite minor in that world. But if you've killed somebody, if you've taken a life, if you've committed some criminal activity, um, the residue of that marks you and it stays mm-hmm. with you and it stays in your mind to the point where if you think about how I have stress around my email inbox, you know, I wake up thinking, oh, I've got to email. So if I'm stressed about that, these people are going to be highly stressed about the things that they've done, unless mm-hmm. they're psychopaths or, you know, and that's a completely different category. And a lot of the characters in, in Khan and Vengeance are not psychopaths. They're ordinary people in extraordinarily bad situations, doing extraordinarily bad things. Mm. And I kind of hope that we, when we read these stories, it just gives us pause when people do things that we don't like. We think, hang on, what's happening here? Why are they doing it? Um, and how are they going to feel about it afterwards? And, and ourselves too. If I do this bad thing, mm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think about it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, When writing the books, what has been your favourite thing or your favourite character or your favourite thing to explore? I love writing the relationship between Jia Khan and Ilyas Mm. because I just don't understand it. And I love the fact that he loves her, Mm. but also what's wrong with him? Like, why is he with this woman? So I love that. Um, And I, I love figuring out how they argue and what makes them stick together what makes him be with her and what makes her be with him. Hmm. Uh, I also really love the, the, the criminal aspect of the cryptocurrency. How can I come up with a new crime? What's going yeah. on? How really rich people hide money. I'm, I've got quite a lot of books here about serious money. I really love these stories around the uber rich. Um, and you mentioned earlier about how there is a, uh, you know, there can be one person at the head of this thing. So I love podcasts. Like There's a fantastic podcast at the FT called Hot Money. And one of them actually talks about this international cabal that runs the entire world of crime. Um, so I love that too. Hmm. And um, you have left a little bit of an opening for a further plot and more stories. Um, will there be another book? There will be another book. There will be one more book. Um, I've just been offered a deal by my publishers so there will be one last Khan mm-hmm. I think one, as far as I'm concerned there'll be one last Khan that's it um, and then I'm hoping that will be just the close of it it'd be nice to have a trilogy three of them together yeah 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 there definitely feels like that there needs to be at least one more Han what do you think should happen in it because you've asked me lots of questions well I think that there is, that Jia Han has a, a sibling that she needs to meet. I think that sibling is going to come and right all the wrongs. <laughs> and, <Right. laughs> and I think, and I think Ahad, I also, I really like the character of Ahad. I think he is so loved, but misunderstood by his mother. Very sweet and also very innocent. And I think he needs to, understand the world a bit better and then decide what he wants to do about it that's good I like that I might steal that one that's what I would like to see (laughs) but (laughs) thank you as we as we wrap up what do you really hope for anyone that picks up the uh, vengeance or or even the Han what do you hope they take away from your work I hope they're really entertained I hope Mm. that when they read them they come away thinking that was just so much fun to read that's all I hope for that they just are entertained for a few hours and they just like they're gripped by it and they think that that was a good read (laughs) oh well I'm sure they will be and I I hope the same for you but Simon thank you so much for your time today it's been so wonderful speaking to you thank you so much